Hi church family, a warm welcome to you from me and my boys this morning. Jesse is still in his pajamas, as some of you may still be as well. Um, just know that we love you and we miss you. One of the upcoming events just to be on your radar is that we have another women's book club coming up on October 21st. So you are welcome to contact me or Melissa Jarvis to get more information on that. And then our American Heritage Girls and our Trail Life Boys have their annual cider um, fundraiser. They make cider for us. So if you're interested in participating in that or getting some cider, contact Tanya Young. Or of course, you can always contact the church office and they can get you connected. Can you say hello? Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, church. Say hello. He said hello, church. <laughs> we'll hopefully see you soon. My worth is not in what I owe Not in the strength of flesh and bone But in the costly wounds of love at the cross My worth is not in skill or name in win or lose, in pride or shame But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross And I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul Satisfied in Him alone, my soul is satisfied. 
Well, hey, church family, here we are again in the book of James, uh, asking the Lord through this text, through this book of the Bible, what we can learn for today. And today, the question that we're going to ask uh, comes from chapter five. Is more money the answer? You say, well, the answer to what? Well, <laughs> the answer to any problem that we have. If you were to talk to someone in Washington, D.C., in all likelihood, if you bring up some sort of a problem with society, they would tell you about how many billions of dollars they're allocating to solve that problem. Um, and, and I think that we personalize this, too. Like, we can kind of laugh at how politicians will, you know, throw money at problems that even, even if they're not actually financial in nature, we'll spend some money on it, see if that helps. But I think we do this in our own lives to a certain extent as well. Because when we're facing challenges, we'll, we'll say to ourselves, man, if only I had a little bit more money. I mean, if only I had $5,000 more in my checking account, well, then my problems would go away or they'd be a lot easier to deal with. Um, or depending on how tight your budget is, maybe you say, if only I had $500 more, just $50 more this week, uh, my, my problems would be a little, at least a little bit easier to live through. And as much as we could joke about that, or you know, when we talk about, hey, money doesn't make people happy, but I'm willing to live with it, you know, those kinds of things, um, I do think that there are in the Bible some warnings to us about putting more stock in money than we should, more trust in wealth than we should, and that when we do that, um, instead of money being a blessing in our lives, it can actually become a terrible curse, and it can actually lead us way off track from our purpose in life. So is more money the answer? Let's turn to James chapter 5 and pick up our reading there in verse 1. He says, look here, you rich people, weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you're counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You've spent your years on earth in luxury satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Now, when James wrote this, um, you know, and this is, this is in context of all the other things we've talked about in James, when he ta talks to people about humility and about holding their tongue and, and about the kind of wisdom that comes from above. And, you know, we've got this whole narrative building of all these things that James is saying add up to a, a Christian life, the kind of life that follows Jesus looks like what the book of James tells us. And, and here in the middle of it, he he's kind of gives this big wake-up call, this warning to rich people. And, uh, and so I think there are some warnings that we can pull out of this for us. Uh, whether or not you consider yourself rich, for the purposes of this discussion, I want you to think of it this way. Uh, if you're watching this um, on a computer screen, you're rich enough to have a computer. Um, and if you're, if you're watching this in North America, you're, you're blessed to live in one of the richer parts of the world. And so even if you would say in your own life, I don't always feel rich, um, I think all of us could identify with the fact that we understand what it means to have wealth in our hands um, and to have luxury around us. And we do understand that it is possible for any of us at any income level uh, to get carried away with wealth. And so while James is aiming this at rich people in his generation, I think we can take it personally in our generation. Um, so let, let's, let's break it down a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, Ray Pritchard, a, a preacher, I really like how he um, sort of interpreted the warnings of these texts. So I wanted to show you those. Um, he, he, he kind of gives us this fair warning from James that wealth can, doesn't have to, but it can, wealth can make us arrogant, cruel, self-indulgent, and ruthless. That is, wealth has a way of messing with our minds and our hearts. Uh, wealth has a way of carrying us down a road we didn't expect to go. And that's why it's so important in the Bible. That's why Jesus talks about being faithful with little 
you know, if you're not faithful with a small amount, why, why would someone give you more? It's because something about having possessions and having money and getting income and having treasure, something about that changes who we are, or at least it could change who we are. And, and, it can, and it can magnify whatever is actually happening in, in our heart. So if our hearts are filled with pride, if you give that person a million dollars, it's going to magnify their pride, their arrogance. Uh, on, you know, conversely, the opposite would be true. If someone's heart is filled with generosity when they're poor, if you give them riches, they're go- that, that generosity now gets to be magnified. But wealth does have some risks. There are some pitfalls, some common dangers. And the fact is, uh, according to this text, wealth really can, uh, like Ray Pritchard says, make us arrogant, cruel, self-indulgent, and ruthless. So we don't want to go that direction. Um, How do we make sure we get this right? So let's start with a truth for the day to think about. If your quest for wealth is defining you, it's also distracting you. If your quest for wealth is the definition of your life. If it's what you're dreaming of, if it's, if it's you know, it's not just, you know, of course, we're all working hard and that's part of what we need to be as productive human beings. But if you, if you would consider yourself defined by your quest for more money, more career options, more investment uh, potential out there, um, that, that definition, that wealth that you've allowed to take hold in your heart is in fact distracting you even if you don't realize it. Because while all of your attention is now focused in this world and on what money can do or investments can do or your job can do, you're missing then the purpose of your life. You're missing what life is actually about. Now, so, so the, the rich, if you think about it, the rich are tempted to put their confidence in wealth because they have wealth to put confidence in. And and the the humility and the honesty that James talked about in the previous chapter, where he talks about submitting ourselves to God and being humble before God so that we can re- receive his grace, the rich face a danger in that they may have so much on earth, so much comfort, so much security, so much reoccurring income out there that they don't feel like they need to call on God. And thus, even though they need to be humble, they might not actually be humble. Now, anyone can be filled with pride. Obviously, the most impoverished person out there could also be the most arrogant. Who knows? Uh, But wealth has these additional warnings attached to it because God knows, and you know in your heart, and I know in my heart, that wealth can tempt us away from what we were really made to do. If our wealth starts defining us, it is distracting us. Um, So that, that rich person who thinks they've got it all together, they have plenty for tomorrow. Um, if, and you think about back to James 4, also you know, James is saying, hey, don't be the person who boasts about tomorrow. Don't be the person who just makes all their plans thinking they're in charge of their own life when there, there's so much that's out of your control. Instead, you need to be thinking, all right, whatever God wants. Um, but wealth has a way of making us feel powerful, like we're going to get whatever we want and we can make our own decisions. Um, also, I think, I think it's important to see, and I mean, you can look at this text in the Bible here and just, just think about some of the colorful metaphors that James is using, moth-eaten rags or your flesh being consumed like fire, um, that, that your, your riches, your treasure rising up to testify against you on the day of judgment. I mean, these are pretty powerful, biting terms that are getting used here. Um, wealth can tempt us to disregard others and even perpetrate injustice upon them. And that's what was happening in the first century. Here these rich people were, you know, that they were living lives of luxury while while their field workers were out managing the farm in desperate poverty and not even getting paid fair wages. And so so you know, James is saying, "Hey, God sees you. God knows what's going to happen and or, and and God God has a God has a plan to rectify all this. So you need to be weeping and sad, like look at your future. All the things you're putting your faith in are going to be taken away. Um, So wealth has a way of kind of blinding us. Um, It's sort of like when life becomes about me, then when I meet you, I'm really only interested in what you can do for me. And, And I might even start to see your purpose in life as to get me whatever I want. And, and if you can imagine a boss treating his employees that way, um, you could understand maybe why James was so 
so upset at these rich people who, uh, at least in theory, I mean, when you look at James 1.1, 1, 1, he says that this is James and he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes uh, scattered among the nations. Ostensibly, these are, this, this letter is written specifically to Jewish Christians who are all throughout the Roman Empire. And so to imagine a, I mean, it wouldn't be hard to imagine a rich kind of like maybe their version of like a plantation owner type of a character, um, you know, treating the, the, the slaves and the employees with, with disrespect and not paying them fairly and mistreating them and all sorts of injustice. But, but now imagine this. Now imagine that some of those rich people put their faith in Jesus, become a part of God's family in the church, but they're still acting that way to the people under their care. That's who James is talking to. He's saying, whoa, like recognize. And a few verses later, which we'll talk about next week, it talks about God is the judge. I mean, he's coming soon and, and you're not going to get away with mistreating people. You're not going to get away with injustice. Um, these, these wrongs will be made right. Uh, the, the Greek poet, uh, and, and I can't always say his name right, Antiphanes, um, he said, the quest for wealth darkens our sense of right and wrong. And so, you know, here were these people who, I, I suppose, if you just want to kind of read back a little bit into the text, obviously successful people. They obviously were farmers uh, or they had plantations. And, uh, and so they, they might have been able to pat each other on the back about how, and maybe they were writing the wealth seminars of the day, you know, hey, here's how to get rich in 10 easy steps. And part of those steps, at least for them, was, you know, you, you don't have to pay the fair wage to the field workers. You, 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 you use the people around you to get what you want. And, and wealth has a way of kind of distorting our vision of right and wrong. And if the Greeks knew it back in the 300s, then you and I know it in the 21st century. Uh, wealth has a way of darkening our sense of right and wrong. It darkens our soul. And, uh, and so I think about these Christian converts who, and maybe you could say a few of them, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a past to say, okay, maybe these are new believers. Maybe they really don't know any better. Well, now they know. I mean, the warning is really strong from James that you can't treat people this way and you can't put your confidence in money this way. Your life is now defined a different direction. Now, whether they're Christians or not, obviously it's still a terrible sin what they're doing to their workers. And then in verse 6, we even hear the kind of this ruthlessness where they're, they might even be killing and condemning people who weren't even resisting them, um, all because they had the power and status of wealth. And they were able to get away with it. And they could circumvent justice because they had the best lawyers and all the big dollars behind them. And James says, hey, as a believer in Jesus, you can't live that way. Um, and so you, you, you think about it. You can't apply chapter 4 to your life and then turn around and treat your employees that way. Uh, you can't humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he lifts you up, verse 10 of chapter 4. You can't receive God's grace because of your humility and you submit to God. Uh, and then you turn around and you, and you mistreat people and oppress people. It doesn't compute. It doesn't work. And that's why James is saying, if you're going to live a Christian life, if you're going to live a life filled with humility, then, then you, ha you have to apply that into the real world you're living in. It doesn't just go on in your head like, okay, now I believe and now I'm humble and now I'm prayerful. This has to work itself out in the actions of your life. And instead of doing injustice, you have to be the kind of person who does justice. Um, so uh, I was thinking about how sad it would be to track down this road of selfishness. Because even though temporarily you get the luxury and the comfort that this world has to offer, ultimately you lose. And, and, and I was thinking of it this way, and the people that James is referencing, in their selfish pursuit of luxury, first they lost their spirituality, and then ultimately they lost their very humanity. And everything about them um, was, was wrong. And, and that's why James is saying you need to weep, you need to wail, you need to mourn, because this is not going to go well for you. It is now time to repent before the day of judgment comes and your own wealth rises up to testify against you. So um, you think of people trading away what they actually are, who they actually are, just so that they can grab a little bit more 
with their hands just so that they can own a little bit more or take advantage a little bit more. Um, it's so sad. It kind of reminds me of what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 4 when he said, you did not come to know Christ that way. You can't keep living the way the Gentiles do. And in their context, if they said Gentiles, that meant the world out there. And so here's Paul saying, you can't live the way the world out there lives. You were, you were transformed by Jesus to live a new kind of life. And that, that has to affect the way you think of your money. That has to affect the way you think about justice being done in the world. All right, so it's time for, it was time for them to level up. Uh, they thought they'd reached the pinnacle, right? They were rich, uh, but here they, we find out uh, they're, they're, they're beginners at best um, in their faith, in the application of their faith. It's time to level it up. It's time to live the virtuous and eternal focused life that Jesus died to provide and that actually fills life with purpose. It's time to live a life filled with love, um, instead of selfishness, it's time to walk worthy of the calling that you've received. Here's another truth that I think that we can apply here, uh, that we can consider. Treasures make great tools, but trusting them makes us great fools. I don't know if you know anyone like this. I guess I wouldn't mention anyone by name that I can think of, but certainly it's you don't have to imagine that far. Sometimes it's in your own life, your own story. You realize, wow, yeah, I had, I had a treasure, I had money, I had wealth, I had a great job or whatever, but the, the, the false confidence that filled me with sort of turned me into a fool and I lost sense of priorities and I went the wrong direction. Um, Luke 12 has, has the, one of the best stories to describe all of that. And I just wanted to read you that story from Luke 12. This is where someone comes to Jesus and they're complaining about their some sort of an inheritance dispute with a family member after the father had died. And here's what Jesus said. Yeah, another warning. He said, beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. There it is again. You can't let wealth define you or it will distract you. Uh, this is verse 15, by the way, of Luke 12. Now verse 16. He told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything that you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So there it is. Treasure can be an amazing tool that you can use in your life to do great good in this world. But if you put your whole trust and heart into that treasure, it will turn you into a great fool, just like this guy Jesus talked about. Don't be that guy. Uh, recognize you were made for more than money. Okay, so what does James teach us about money? I, I want to walk through a couple statements here. You'll see these on the screen. Um, money is for a moment, not for eternity. You see that right there in verse one of our text today. Money is for investing, not for hoarding. In fact, James even said, all this money, that this wealth that you've hoarded, uh, often at the expense of others, that's going to rise up against you someday. Money is a tool to serve people. People aren't tools to serve money. You're not a tool to serve money, but also the people around you certainly aren't. And then money won't last, but its testimony concerning you will. And that's where you can imagine uh, on that day of judgment when our lives are being evaluated, the, the money that we've had, the, the riches that we had access to, the, the opportunities that were all around us, the wealth that was placed in our hands, all of that rises up on Judgment Day as a witness, a witness to what we did with our lives, a witness to how we prioritized and what we valued the most and what we thought about the most and what our dreams consisted of and what was really in our hearts. And, and, and whatever that, and the more money you have, had access to throughout your life, the more money now bears witness either for you or against you on Judgment Day. And James is saying to these, 
these people in this context, your, all this treasure you've hoarded is going to rise up against you on Judgment Day uh, because it's evidence of how far away from God your heart really was. Uh, and again, it's this amazing call, this warning. You, you have to repent. Don't let your life go down uh, this dark road. So I thought that we could turn over to 1 Timothy for just a second and look at the instructions that Paul gives to Timothy and how, how he sort of talks to us about what we should do if we do have money in our hands. So that is to the people who are wealthy. I mean, James has this very stark warning. Does that mean you give all your money away and stop working and stop earning? Well, well no, not necessarily. But we need to change how we think about the wealth that we have access to and the opportunities that we have to earn. And, uh, and so let, let's read together 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. So, where do we go from here? Uh, how, do, how do we, uh, even though, uh, I mean, a lot of us have jobs and we're earning money, and in theory, over the course of our lives, if we apply the principles of wisdom and investing and prudence to things, like we will probably will grow in riches. We, we hope that's the case. We want, we want to prosper. We want other people to prosper. So we hope that everybody keeps getting richer. That would be a wonderful thing. Um, but we recognize that the richer we get and the more wealth that we or even our whole country and culture together accumulate, the more risk we have of falling off the rails spiritually, of losing our spirituality and maybe even losing our humanity, of, of what, like Antiphanes said back in Greece, that, that our wealth, would, that our riches would start to distort and cloud our judgment and our, our sense of right and wrong would darken. We don't want that to happen. Um, so I wanted to give a few encouragements to you as, uh, as, as we go forward here, looking at the book of James and recognizing as you know, all the problems that are out there in society, um, money doesn't solve them. Obviously, money is involved in the answers to many of the problems that are out there. And, uh, and a lot of times it's very expensive to try to solve problems. So, so I don't necessarily begrudge when people say, let's spend money to fix something. Uh, I recognize that's part of the reality of the world we live in. Uh, but we have to recognize that money alone is not something we can trust for solutions. And just getting rich, or in the case of government, just printing more money, that doesn't ultimately fix what's wrong. Um, there, there, are, there are issues that are a lot deeper than that, 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 that we have to be a part of the solution. So I was thinking, how, how should a Christian sort of venture through a generally wealthy culture? And, and especially if you would say, yeah, I, I would raise my hand and say, in, in my own way, I mean, in, in, in context here, I, I would have to say, I'm probably pretty rich compared to a lot of people in the world. Uh, so Lord, how do you want me to act with those riches? And how can I protect my heart from getting carried away and getting selfish and self-indulgent and even ruthless and arrogant with my money? Uh, what should I do? So here, here's a few encouragements. Christians, let's first transfer our trust to God. That's what, that's what Paul said to Timothy um, right in 1 Timothy 6. He said it's important that, that we teach people to not put their faith in money and in the, in, the, in the passing riches of this world, but rather to put their trust in God. And so we, we look up to God and we say, Lord, I realize you are the provider, uh, not me and not my boss and not my government and uh, not the stock market, and not, my, not, not the house that's accruing value. No, those things are all great, but those are not, that's, not where, that's not what provides for my needs. Ultimately, Lord, that's you. And so I'll put my faith in you, not in my money or in my ability to earn money. And when we cross that bridge, we come back to humility, which is where chapter 4 of James left us. Humility is always the key to every aspect of how to live as a Christian. 
Uh, no matter what you study in the Bible, you'll always find that. And James, I just think the whole book of James turns on that, so that's, that simple principle, uh, that if you'll humble yourself, God will give you his grace. But as long as you're proud, God will resist you. So it starts when you trust God instead of money. It's almost like saying, I'm going to trust God instead of myself. Instead of what I can get or what I can amass or what I can create, Lord, I'm trusting you instead. So that helps us stay humble. That helps us stay in our place. Um, then what, what else should we do? Well, here's the second thing. Give more than we take. As believers in Jesus, as we think about the lives that we have in this world, if we use that simple premise that I, I, want, to, I want to be giving um, and serving more than I'm taking, taking and being served, that will always help us have a, a mentality of generosity um, so that we don't end up getting selfish and we don't end up hoarding luxury to ourselves. You know, it, it doesn't say in the Bible that you can't have luxuries. And even in 1 Timothy, when it says, you know, God gave us these things for our enjoyment, it, it's, it, this, isn't, this isn't some sort of poverty oath we all have to take. This is a mentality shift. To say, when, when, I, when I came into this world, I, I want to leave the world a better place than what I found it when I came in. Um, sometimes you can even apply this really, really simply, just in like a room you walk into. I want to leave this room a little better than what I found it. Or you, you, you walk into a situation, a relationship, a, a church even. You say, I just want to leave this place a little bit better than I found it. I, I always want to be giving more than I'm taking. If that's your mentality, it kind of helps, it helps frame the idea that my life is not just centered around me and what I can get and what I can keep for myself. Um, here, here's the third encouragement. Become rich in good deeds. So when Paul told Timothy that we need to teach wealthy believers to be rich in good deeds, that what that means is that, you know, the world will teach you how to be rich in, in money and, and kind of not even if it's evil, but rich in selfish deeds, like rich in getting more for you. How do I get more, keep more, earn more, invest more, end up with more? As a believer in Jesus, you say, well, the reason I would do any of that to begin with is because I want to do more good in this world. I want to give more than I'm taking. And so, so my investments really aren't just about me and my comfort. They're about how much can I earn so that I can give, so that I can serve, so that I can have the freedom and opportunity to do more good in this world, be rich in good deeds. And if you were thinking about your life portfolio that someday you'll set before God, and, and maybe in that portfolio, you say, hey, I raised some kids and I, you know, I, I, I prayed in the mornings or you know, whatever the things you do for the Lord are. Uh, in that portfolio, you say, well, is my portfolio rich in good deeds or is it, is it a little bit poor in good deeds because I've put so much of my effort into riches in this world, riches that will ultimately pass away? Hey, here's the fourth thing. Invest for the really long-term future. When Paul told Timothy that we should be teaching the rich the, these priorities, he said that the, it, it has to do with thinking about, you know, they should be laying up treasure for the future, a good foundation for the, the, a different kind of life, the life that is really life. And, and, and you know, he didn't specify that's just in heaven necessarily, but the, the idea is you're thinking way beyond yourself. And you're thinking way beyond just this earth and the next moment and the next way you can spend money, you know, the next, the next car you want, the next house you want to buy. Uh, the, the, all, all those things might be okay, but if you can change your mentality to think in this much longer term, much bigger picture, um, you can avoid the errors that those Christians in James 5, 1 through 6 were committing. Uh, those, those terrible sins. And, you know, and like I said, maybe we give them a little benefit of the doubt, say they're new believers, they didn't know yet. Um, but it seems like anyone with half a heart would know that that, that, that kind of life would be wrong. Um, and that they needed to repent. So James is challenging them so strongly to do so. Uh, so you and I, we can get this right even before we get to the place of riches in our lives where we say, I'm going to consistently invest in the really long-term future, that future that goes past myself and my own comfort and my own desires and thinks about eternity and thinks about God's kingdom and thinks about the good of others and thinks about the, the good of the world around me. Uh, that's the kind of investing that 
um, that makes the most sense and that will ultimately build for you a real foundation of real treasure that will last long into your eternal future. Okay, and then here's the final encouragement for today. Be humble, productive, and open-handed with whatever wealth we have. So when we receive money or the opportunity to make money, instead of that puffing us up with pride, instead of that making us arrogant and looking down all the people that have less than we do, instead we stay humble. We, and we recognize, Lord, I first of all have to thank you for the opportunity here. And I recognize this is all dedicated to you. And so in humility, Lord, help me to, to manage this money well. And help me to keep my priorities, my heart in the right place and not fall into the traps that wealth can often set for us. Um, then to be productive. Like we want to be humble about this, but we also want to be aggressively productive with our lives. To say, I'm not here like the people in James 5 that were just sort of hoarding treasure and living in the lap of luxury for themselves. That's not what we're here for. Um, so we look around us and we say, how can I add value? How can I create value in this world? And we get as productive as we can with the whatever God puts into our hands. But then as God puts it into our hands, here's the, the third part of the challenge, is to keep an open hand, an open heart about whatever that wealth is. I don't, I'm not clenching to it going, this is mine. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm keeping my hand open and saying, Lord, you gave, you can take away. Um, Lord, how do you want me to use this? Um, to advance your kingdom or to share with others or to care for people in need? How do you want me to use this in a way that's honorable, in a way that glorifies you, in a way that loves others? Uh, that's the attitude. And, the, and that, that means whether God puts a billion dollars into your hand or just a $10 bill, either way, you still have the same mentality about it, that this is really not just about me. Uh, this is about that really long-term future, and this is about honoring God with my wealth. All right, so let's pray. Let's ask for God's help, because I know that every single one of us is starting somewhere here. So the good news about this message, you know, maybe you read the text ahead of time. You thought, oh, this is for rich people. That's not me. Here's the good news. All of us um, are starting. So all of us have something in our hand. We all are starting with at least a little bit of wealth, a little bit of money, a few riches. And some of us have a lot more than a few. And, and so we say, Lord, with whatever I've got today, I want to be faithful with that. So let's pray and ask for his help. Lord, you see and know what we have. And, and I know it's hard for us to remember, I guess, how much we have compared to previous generations. And in some contexts, Lord, we could look at other places around the world or even other places in our community and realize that we might have a lot more than another person. Um, and so, Lord, wherever we're at on the scale of all of this, uh, our point isn't to compare. Our point is to say, whatever we have, we want to be faithful to you. We want to, to live a life of humility and to live a life that really follows in the way of Jesus, not just mentally or emotionally, academically, uh, not just in our minds and in our prayers, but actually in the way we conduct our business, the way we live. We want to treat people honorably, the way you would treat people. Lord, those of us who are, uh, who are bosses or employers or investors, and we have the opportunity to lead others, Lord, we want to, we want to lead them well, and we want to love them and, and treat them with justice. Lord, those of us who are, who are climbing the ladder of, and, and, and we're trying to earn our, our money and, our, and try to advance our career, Lord, help us to have the strength to be productive, not just for our own luxury's sake, our own comfort's sake, but rather, Lord, so that we have even more freedom and opportunity to serve you and to do good in this world. We know that's really what we're here for. So, Lord, I pray for anyone in our church family who needs this message right now, anyone who needs to hear these warnings from James. Lord, may it never be true that one of us falls into this pit of selfishness and, and all the accompanying disaster that goes with that spiritually and personally and eternally. Rather, Lord, we, we want to live lives that really are focusing on you. And, and we thank you, Lord, for the money that we have, the, the wealth that we have, the opportunities that are around us. We pray that you would give us your grace as we try to do our best with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.